Germans had invaded Belgium, we had demanded that they withdraw from Belgium. They had not, and so war was declared. In Folkestone, for instance, there, there were many people down for the weekend for their bank holiday trip to the seaside. And the declaration of war suddenly turned Folkestone from this seaside town, almost overnight, into a massive army camp. My father, Richard Gilden, he worked at the forge and he was a farrier at Cheriton. He shoes the horses and so he joined the machine gun corps as a farrier. What his real name, his dad, was Francis Taylor, but he was known as Frank. He, he must have joined in uh, 1914, as soon as it started. Because he was a butcher at 18 uh, at Broadstairs. And then the first picture we got of him is on the horse in 1914. And then all his brothers all followed. Well, they, one of them joined the same as my dad, Royal Horse Artillery. Uh, the other one joined the Kent Cyclist. And the youngest one, he didn't go in until 1917. And he served his time out in India. My great-grandfather, Henry Pope, was born in Dimchurch. He was a gardener and groom at a big house, so all the lighting would have been, it would have been candle and oil lighting. And a similar situation with water. We had, like, water carriers who would uh, distribute water um, from the village pump up the road. With his three other brothers, they all went and served in World, World War I. The Dimchurch Pals, they were 12 lads. They joined the Kent Cyclist Battalion. They went to war on push bikes. My father, Ernest Frederick Coker, we well, joined up with the rest of the village. They all joined up together, all the youngsters all at once. They went into the uh, Kent Cyclist. Oh yes, because I mean, that they went to war on with bicycles with all their suffering on the back behind the saddle and the gun, uh, you know, tied uh, onto the crossbar. In the First World War, we were called Barbed Wire Island because the whole of the island was, um, the coastline of the island was covered with barbed wire. Passports were issued in the First World War to come onto Sheppey and you even had to have another more high security uh, passport to come into Blue Town and Sheerness Dockyard because it was so important to the defence of the country. Folkestone and Dover both were designated restricted areas which meant that, amongst other things, you needed passes to travel into certain parts of the town. The Dover Patrol came into existence and over the next few years, the course of the war, the number of vessels increased massively from that original 30 to over 300. Some of them were existing Royal Navy ships that were based at other locations around the country and they were brought into Dover. The trawlers were pre-war fishing trawlers and they were drafted in together with their civilian fishermen crews who basically volunteered to come and work at Dover. There is no doubt that the Germans knew how important that crossing was. If they had managed to interrupt that flow of humanity, of our men, to the Western Front, we would have been out of the war. Dear Ma and Pa, just arrived here sailing today. 
please do not worry for my sake. It is doing nothing, only rain. Your loving son. The situation in Belgium was very serious in October 1914. Refugees were in the tens of thousands. It's uh, really, I think, an amazing story and an inspiring story in the way, the way the people of Kent, and particularly in Folkestone, responded to that crisis. There were so many people who were helpful, so many systems that were set up so quickly, even though basically, so that these people could be fed, um, housed. Um, you know, if they needed medical care, they would be moved on. The German army was advancing fast across Belgium. And so the Belgian army fell back, taking with them whatever wounded uh, and indeed sick soldiers they could. It was an emergency situation, which when the British government discovered it, um, they commandeered all the Channel steamers and sent them across to bring the men back to England. So the men would arrive here pretty well direct from uh, the battlefield. And once you were brought back from uh, the Western Front and you were in a VAD hospital, you might be quite severely wounded, you might have lost a limb. There was Bradley, who had a wound in his side the size of a saucer. So deep was it, and he so weak, that sometimes the functions of his body operated through it. He was not my case, but he liked to talk to me. Bradley was a Lancashire lad. He resented the war which had sent him back to England, a bit of human flotsam. Latterly, he was transferred to Herne Bay Military Hospital. I sat beside him in those last few minutes at Quex. He knew no other home now and seemed to have no people. The ambulance came to the hall door. We waved until it was out of sight, lost down the long winding drive. Two days later, Bradley died. Sheer inability to face the future. Homesickness for the only home he had known for nearly two years, Quex. In the two minutes silence every November, it is Bradley who comes to me and stays until the noise of the world breaks through. Of all of them, why should it be Bradley? He was a ghost in life. He is my ghost in November. But it's, it's so sad, we don't have more, more information like this about, about these women who worked here. Incredible women. Yeah. Canadian arrived uh, in the UK at Plymouth by ship from Canada directly um, and they arrived by train uh, into Folkestone and Shorncliffe Station particularly. There were such a number of them. So much so the effect on Folkestone, the town of Folkestone, is it became called a, a suburb of Toronto. In the region of 34,000 formed the second Canadian Expeditionary Force. Zeppelins uh, attacked Ramsgate. Gas works was blown up with various other things and quite a lot of schools and, and, and uh, houses were knocked flat. You'd hear the throbbing of this end of the engines going along and you could see it coming along steady and so this huge thing of 50 miles an hour and you'd think, oh my God, what's going on? And then you just it would just come on and come on and come on and get bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, it's a terror weapon, the fact that nobody could feel safe in their home anymore. If you've not seen them, if you've hardly ever seen a, a, a plane or anything, and you see this huge monster, and you think, because of its huge size, you think, my God, you know, it's going to end it all.
Richborough Port, which is further down the road in the bay there, uh, that came into uh, service, and again, you had to go near Ramsgate in order to, to uh, service it. They were building barges there, they were, there was a first roll and roller, ferries were operating out of there, enormous amounts of tanks and artillery, munitions of all sorts and various things. The things that make the army fight, the supplies for the army, went through Richborough. My um, great granddad, Harold Herbert Back, a friend of his asked if he would take his shift for him. So he went onto the Princess Irene, they were doing maintenance work that was commandeered by the Navy as a mine layer. A mine exploded. An eyewitness who saw the ship explode said that the flames were two miles high. But to me that was such a, a fateful day for him because he shouldn't have been there. I don't think the war didn't go to a set pattern. They were stalemate. They were stuck in Belgium. It was the width of a canal which separated the Germans uh, from you know, the Allied forces. So with regards to cycling, they were bogged down. There was nowhere to go. The cyclist battalions were then amalgamated into the other um, units, plus the fact that the bigger units were running short of men because they were being killed. I had a letter from France yesterday. He wished me to give you all his love. We'll write as soon as he can, but things are keeping him busy. We heard the bombs dropping quite distinctly here. Give my love to Maud. Love, Effie. Your ever-loving daughters. We are a funny lot. Never mind. Of uh, Florence Louisa Franklin. She was engaged to this young person, Gorham, you know, and they just both fell in love with each other. This one fateful day, he sent her a letter and he put 13 kisses on it. And the following Friday the 13th, he dies. That was just a month later. Well, it'd be all these letters we got, like, you know, and she always thought about him all her life, even to her last few days of living, like, you know, my mother. She was still thinking about him. But she did go on to marry another man from our village, and, um, and they had children, but she never forgot her first love. And even to her grandchildren, right up to my mother died, she would always get these books out and uh, talk to them about, about Gorham, as if we knew the person. So Robert went off to war and the family actually moved to Folkestone. Lillian decided she needed to go to Tontine Street uh, to go to the shops and she set off in the pram with the youngest daughter, Daisy. Mums were queuing outside Stokes Brothers and the kids were playing in the street. The other two girls, Ivy and Sissy, went out to play on a nearby 
a, a railway bank, it was actually. Um, anyway, when the children got to the railway bank, they found there was a horse tied up there. And Ivy was really scared of horses, so she ran home. <laughs> and the other children, Sissy and some other children they were with, they all followed her home. So as the Gothers flew over, and one of them dropped a bomb, it was a 50 kilogram high explosive, and that landed in the street just outside Stokes Brothers. About half of the bombs they dropped that day were duds, they didn't explode. That one did. Lillian stopped to chat with, uh, with a neighbour en route, and um, that was the day that Tontim Street was bombed. The scene of devastation that was described by the people who went to the rescue is almost unimaginable. 61 people were killed instantly and many more died of their wounds over the succeeding days and weeks. And of course they were mostly mums and their children. The shop that Lillian was going to was completely destroyed. And it also turned out that the, the horse on the railway bank was also killed. <laughs> so a whole branch of the Pope family could have died in one go if things had been very slightly different. The, the Dover Patrol had had two roles really. One was the, the defensive role, that is where they were protecting the troop ships and generally protecting the coast. In addition to that they had an offensive job as well which was to support our troops on the Western Front. The Dover Patrol's part in the Zeebrugge raid was significant, although the, the raid itself had limited tactical benefits. The contribution of that raid to the morale of the British public and British troops at a time when our backs were to the war, when we could have so easily lost the war, that contribution cannot be overstated. To this day, there are 10 new boats um, lying on the bottom of the channel from the First World War that were sunk by the ships of the Dover Patrol. The Channel was a very notorious place because there's so many men died, you know, from the uh, torpedoes and it happened so, so much. We've had quite a few men that um, were torpedoed on ships in the Channel here. And of course there's nothing found at all of them, the ship's blown, blown up. So the families have got no grave to visit. They're just out there in the channel somewhere, that's very sad. You can see the war weariness on the faces. As far as the town was concerned, of course there was relief. There were street parties. Perhaps in Folkestone and Dover, they had an extra poignancy because we had been really at the sharp end. So the arrival of peace had a particular significance. Dear yeah, Mum, coming home on Monday. How are you going on? Still going on fine. Love to all, Will. They must have found it very difficult to go back to the way things were, because everything had changed. Well, I think it changed the family life completely. It must have taken years to settle back down into a normal life. 
And I don't think some of them did, really. Probably changed them forever. Now oh, that is not the question, can we ever stop war? Now then, Arthur, you're not saying much. What do you think? Can we ever stop war? Now, would you mind me relating a little experience of mine? You see, it bears on this question. Do you think we can just spare the time? So now when I get away quiet, I find myself on parade just once more. With old comrades again, I will go through something which happened before. Yes, I just sit down quiet and fancy that I've lived it all over again. Perhaps it is a night working party, trudging along in the mud and the rain, or carrying up rations in sandbags with the old petrol tins full of tea, then found out we had lost direction and are stranded, lost all at sea. While we've all heard a lot of talking and read plenty of papers, I'm sure, on this most vital question, can we ever stop war?